Hello, and welcome to this vSuite version 0.6 video tutorial. And in this video tutorial, I'm going to cover sky view factor analysis and shadow mapping. And I'm doing them both in this single video because they have both very similar workflows. So I'm going to show you how to do both types of analysis, but I'm only going to really show you all the display options for the shadow map analysis. So hopefully, although I'm covering two types of analysis here, this video won't be too long. Now, I've started my, my beginning scene is uh, very similar to the one I used in the SunPath tutorial. So I have this little section of an urban environment somewhere in London, I believe. And I've got a simple ground plane and I'm going to do a sky view factor analysis on this urban context. Now, for those that don't know, sky view factor is a, a very simple metric that defines from a particular point in space how much of the sky you can see as a percentage. So sky view factor is used often for doing urban anal analyses where we're looking at sort of urban canyon uh, situations and we want to see how exposed to the sky uh, a particular point in space say at street level for example is um, and it's things like sky view factor analysis that have inspired the skyline of so like new york where buildings are often stepped away from the street as they go up so that you get a greater view of the sky from street level. And it helps keep New York feeling a little bit less um, oppressive than it might do otherwise. So let's crack on. So I'm just gonna expand my, I'm currently in my vSuite nodes window. I already have a node tree created, which I did in the last some path video. Now I'm going to add a couple of nodes for a sky view factor analysis. So for sky view factor, I can go straight to analysis nodes, sky view. I need no location node here because we're only looking at the proportion of the sky we can see. The nature of the sky doesn't matter. So I need no VI location node. All I need is this node. But before I do the actual analysis, let's come back into the 3D view. And we do need geometry within this scene, which is going to represent the viewpoints that we're going to calculate the proportion of the sky we can see from. So for this initial analysis, I'm going to use this ground plane, uh, which would be a sort of uh, common thing to do for sky view factor analysis. So this plane at the moment, if I go into edit mode and go into maybe wireframe mode, we can see that this ground plane only has one face in it. And the center of this face is represented by this little dot here. Now, if I was to use that plane as is, then if I've got faces selected here, I would only calculate sky view factor at this central point here, which actually lies within a building, so I wouldn't see anything. So this plane needs to be subdivided in order to give us more result points to work with. So if I, and there are a couple of ways to do that in the V-Suite, I'm going to show you the simplest one here. So if I right click, the first option in my menu is subdivide. And bear in mind, I need to be in edit mode with a face selected. But if I now click subdivide, I've subdivided that face once. And now I have four faces, but that's still not really enough. That's in a building. That's almost in a building. That was in a building. And the resolution wouldn't be great. So uh, when you do a subdivide, you'll get a little operator context menu down here. If I expand that. I'm going to do 30 cuts. So now I have subdivided by 30 by 30 that ground plane. It's still a very coarse 
grid. I could subdivide it more, but I want to keep everything relatively quick for this video tutorial. So that will do for now. Now, in addition to subdividing the plane, the plane needs to have a kind of material associated with it that will sense lighting or sense how much of the view of the sky we have. So to this object, in my material properties panel, I am going to either create a new material, but I've actually got a material I set up earlier. I've called it shadow sense. So once I've selected that, that material is now associated with this plane. So if I now, I'll just close those down. If I now come down to the V-Suite material section, which you may need to expand, make sure material type, instead of geometry, we have light sensor. And that now specifies that this geometry at every point of the face, because I've got faces selected here, if I've got vertices selected down here, then it would be at every vertex, but I'm going to stick with faces. At the center of every face, this plane will represent uh, the viewpoints for the sky view factor calculation. So let's just go back to, oh, and one other thing I will do, because this is very important, is I will check the normal direction. Now normals are, they represent the way geometry is facing. And what we're interested in here is the way the faces are facing. The faces of this plane could be facing up or they could be facing down. And we can check that by going into edit mode and we'll see if I come to this overlay option and down here under normals, I can select whether I'm going to do face normals or edge normals or vertex normals, it's face normals I'm interested in. I just make them bigger. And I want to make sure that my normals point in the way we're looking or for a sky view factor calculation towards the sky. If they're pointing downwards, then you can use your Alt N normals menu to flip your normals or recalculate your normals but just make sure and this is the case for shadow mapping and all kinds of lighting analysis with Livy as well make sure your normals point in the right direction so they do so that's fine so now i will come to the skyview factor node and some of the options within the node so this ignore sensor toggle means that Sensing planes will ignore each other. Or if a sensing plane has a very complex geometry, it won't shade itself. Because I have a single plane here, which is flat, it, it doesn't self-shade, so I, I don't need to turn this on. Um, animation, we could animate the geometry here, for example. So I won't cover that right now. I'm gonna stick with static. So we're just gonna do a single simulation. This sky patches option, there's more details in the user manual about this. Suffice to say for now, that as we go from Tregenza to Reinhardt 577 to Reinhardt 2305, we subdivide the sky more and more. So as we come down this list, the simulation will take longer, but we'll get more refined results, more accurate results. So again, for the purposes of keeping things quick for this video, I'm going to just stick with Tregenza. Result point, I touched on this, whether it's the faces or the vertices of this sensing plane that we've created, that will be our actual sensor locations, and I'm going to stick with faces. And this offset option, which you'll see in all kinds of lighting analyses within VSuite, offset is useful if the geometry that you're using as a sensing plane is very complex. And there are situations where the calculated center of a face, for example, is actually underneath 
the geometry of the face. Now, if you don't know what I mean by that, don't worry. But for the purposes of right now, if you find that if you've got a complex sensing surface and some of the results are zero, and they shouldn't be zero, then try and increase this number. And it just sets the calculation point a little bit further away from the actual sensing geometry. But I have a flat plane, nothing very uh, complicated going on there. So I'm just going to keep that at 0 0.01 for the moment. So I can now press sky B factor. So this is a pretty quick calculation, nothing too complicated happens in the background. So if I come back into my 3D view and click on solid mode, now, in these tabs up here, we should have a V-Suite tab. Make sure that is selected. You also might need to open up this little sidebar here. But with V-Suite selected, and if I expand up the, v, the VI display section, then I now have this sky view display option. Now, this toggle would allow me to do some sort of 3D representation of the results. I'm just going to turn that off for now. I'm just going to press Sky View Display. So we will now see a coloration of that sensing plane as um, defined by the amount of sky we can see from every point on this plane. So away from the buildings, we can see a lot of the sky and within the buildings, we can't see so much. Um, one thing you'll notice is that we, we now have a VI display icon up here. And this icon designates a legend. So if I click this, I now have a legend to go along with my results. Now, if I hover over the top left corner of this legend, I can move it. And if I hover over the bottom right, I can expand and contract it. So these are values in percentage. So we now have a numerical value associated with this coloration. Now, just while I'm here, I'm not going to, like I say, I'm not going to dwell too long on the some of the display options here. I'll cover that in the next shadow mapping section. But something I will, uh, we can, if we click on this again, we'll toggle it off. Something I will cover here very briefly is now that I've sort of done visualizing, I'm going to turn off display active. It's important to do that whenever you're done visualizing. And I'm just going to delete this visualization plane. Now, one thing I just want to say right now is it is possible because our sensing plane is just standard blender geometry, we can do all sorts of things to it. So let's say, for example, I wanted higher resolution on my results in this section of my uh, urban scene. I could just click those particular faces, right click subdivide. And if I want, I can now subdivide again those particular faces. So now I've got much more faces, higher density of faces within this section of my sensing plane. So if I now do a sky view factor analysis again, again very quick, sky view display, switch to solid mode, I'll now see we've got much more resolved results within that particular section of my urban scene. So using Blender geometry to generate these sensing services does give you a lot of flexibility about their shape, um, the sort of resolution or the density of the faces within it to uh, refine the results that you're generating. So I think that's all I need to cover for SVF analysis per se. I'm going to now move on to shadow mapping. And most of the things I'm going to cover in shadow mapping will apply to the display options for SVF as well. 
So one thing I'm going to do is I'm no longer going to have the ground plane as a sensing plane. So to stop that being a sensing plane, I'm going to give this object a different material. So instead of shadow sense, I'm just going to tick, pick material zero. Now this material is just a V-suite material geometry material type. So this will now not generate result points. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a roof of my urban scene. Now remember, and this hopefully will be clear from the previous Sun Powers video, positive Y is north in the V-suite. So I'm going to pick a roof which is going to get a little bit of overshadowing. So I'm going to pick this one here. So I'm going to click on my build geometry and I'm going to go into edit mode and I'm going to select this particular face. Now, I could just subdivide this face, except that I can't because this face, uh, the edges around this face have already been kind of subdivided. So that subdivision doesn't really work. It doesn't give me any more faces within the face. I see that a bit clearer if I come into wireframe mode. So you still only got one face point here. So I'm going to instead, with that single face selected, and I should say also, even if I could subdivide this face, I would get a very strange looking subdivision. When I subdivided the ground plane, the ground plane was square. And when I subdivided it, I got square faces. In fact, well, to demonstrate that, what I, what I might do is I'm going to duplicate that face. I'm going to move it up ever so slightly. I'm going to partition that face. Now, I know a lot of things I'm talking about here. If you're not familiar with Blender, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. But the V-Suite does probably require you to get your head a little bit around Blender and how to use it. Suffice to say that I have duplicated that single face and I've now partitioned it. And I've now partitioned it into its own object. So if I now come into here, this single object has one face. Now, if I subdivide it, that is still not working. So what I might do is I might just do um, a limited dissolve on that. And what I might try now is subdividing it again. And it turns out that this shape simply does not want to be subdivided. And I can try one more thing, but I think we simply cannot subdivide that face, no matter what. So that simple subdivision technique won't work on this shape of face. So the V-Suite presents you with another option instead, which is VI Gridify. Now you'll only see this if you're in edit mode and if you have a geometry and you have, and especially if you have geometry, which only has one face in it or an object, which only has one face in it, which this one does, I can hit the gridify and this will give me a regular grid of subdivisions on that face. So this is useful for cases where you can't subdivide a face because it won't let you. Or it's useful where the shape of the face is a weird shape and the subdivisions therefore give you weird subdivisions, which normally when we're generating sensor points for a numerical analysis, we don't want. So the gridify option allows you to take any sort of irregular shaped face, as long as it's just a single face, and we can separate it out into these regular, um, this regular grid format. Now we can change the spacing of the regular grid format 
with these US and ACS options here. And I can also rotate that. So I kind of want it maybe lined up with this bottom edge, more or less. I'm not going to worry about it too much. So that face has now been subdivided as we want. Bear in mind, if you use the gridify option twice in a row, it will crash Blender. You have to come out of edit mode and go back into edit mode before each grid gridify operation. So, okay, so we have now have an object with this um, mesh grid subdivision, that's good. So now I am going to give this the sensing plane material specification or the sensing material specification. So now the sensing material is associated with the top of that roof. Now I could just do a sky view factor analysis on there, but I'm not going to because I'm now going to move to a shadow map analysis. Now a shadow map analysis does require a VI location node, either manual or energy plus specified. I'm going to stick to manual. This is approximately Brighton in the UK and analysis nodes shadow map. Once I've like brought in my location node, then I get some options within this shadow map node. Ignore sensor, same as before, all sensing surfaces will ignore themselves in terms of shadowing. Again, I have this um, animation option here, which I think I'll cover in a separate video because I don't want this one to get too long. So I'm going to keep this at static. Now I can specify for a shadow map analysis, we determine what proportion of the time of the simulation a particular sensing point is in the sun. And this assumes that the sun, it's a sunny sky all the time. So we need to specify what range of time we're going to do the simulation for. Now, again, I want to keep things quick because I'm in uh, doing this video. So I'm just going to pick the first three months of the year. We can also set an hour range. Now, a shadow mapping analysis in VSuite only actually does calculations when the sun is above the horizon. There's no point doing a shadow map calculation at night time. But we can reduce the range of hours that we're going to look at just because it makes the um, it makes the calculation a little bit quicker because it can instantly discard the hours outside of this range. So I'm just going to go five in the morning to eight in the evening. I'm going to do one simulation step per hour. This would be two per hour or once every half hour, four per hour, once every 15 minutes. But for speed, I'm going to stay on one. Faces and vertices, same as before. Offset, same as before. So if I now do a calculate on that, which was quicker than I imagined, I might actually go, um, I might do first six months or so, first 180 days of the year. Now you'll see this window pop up. This is a Kivi window and we can cancel the calculation here if we want to. Um, and it will also, if the calculation is going to take a while, it will try and give you an estimation of the time it'll take for the calculation to run. So if I come back into here, now I get a little bit of noise here and that's because the two, this plane and the roof plane are quite similarly positioned and there's a bit of overlapping. Sometimes you need to play about with this clip start and clip end option in the view tab and that's not going to do it for me in this case so instead what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this geometry 
slightly off that roof line. That's just for the clarity of the visualization within this 3D view here. So, but in the V-Suite tab, we've now got shadow display. So if I click that, we now get a shadow analysis on that roof. So we can see now what proportion of the time this roof sees direct sun, or the different points on this roof sees direct sun. So if I come into sort of top view, we can see that this is north coming up here. So the parts of the roof to the south or closest to these higher buildings here, start to see less sunshine, less proportion of the time. Now we have this legend icon here, does the same as before. So this now says for the proportion of our simulation time, which was the first six months of the year, what, pro what proportion of that time will a particular point see sunshine? So up here, we're seeing sunshine 73, 74% of the time. Down here, we're seeing it only 60% of the time. We, in addition to this legend icon, we have this heat map icon. And this will tell us what proportion of this total area is lit, sunlit, for each day and for each hour in that day. So the very start of the year, so we're more or less mid-winter, there's only a small patch of the day in the middle where this object is seeing any sun whatsoever. And as we come into the spring, day gets longer, sun gets higher in the sky, and we see more and more of this object being exposed to sunshine. So this is a percentage of the total area sunlit for each day and each hour. That's kind of good for if this plane wasn't a roof, but it was um, solar panels, for example. This would give us a good handle on when in the year our solar panels are receiving sunlight, or perhaps more importantly, when they're not. So now I'm just going to come into the display options. And like I say, generally, this applies to both this analysis and the Skyview Factor analysis, and indeed to most kinds of analysis with Livy. So um, I can specify the result type. So embedded within this object, there can be different types of results. And you can select those different types of results here. For a shadow mapping analysis and for a sky view factor analysis, there's only one kind of result. There's only be, going to be one thing in this um, option. And that is, in this case, percentage sunlit. But I can also make some alterations to this. So let's say, for example, I wanted to know the total number of hours over this simulation period that these points on this roof were illuminated by the sun directly. So I could put into here, legend unit, sunlit hours, and that will simply change the text of my legend. And under this processing option, instead of none, I can select modifier. Now I'm just going to re remove that pre-existing string. Now, when I select modify, I've got this little string box down here. Now, this allows us to change the numerical values being exposed. Now, I'm going to come down here to this window. And in this window, I have the text editor window selected. And within the different text files I've got registered with Blender, I'm going to select this vSuite log file. Now, I don't think I've, I haven't really spoken about the vSuite log file before. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to turn off visualization for a moment. I'm going to expand this window. 
And this vSuite log file just gives, uh, can give error data, can be give status messages. Um, you can find uh, information here about what the vSuite is doing. And often if you post a bug report, it can be useful to, to post uh, what seems relevant within this vSuite log file. But the bit I'm interested in, in here is when I do a shadow map calculation, the vSuite log file will tell me over how many days I did the calculation, how many samples per hour I did the calculation for, what the total number of hours were over that simulation period, and the number of hours where the sun was above the horizon. And it's this number that we've done our percentage calculation for. So if I wanted to know, so I've, did it, I've done it for 800, and, sorry, I did the second one in the end. So I did it for 2,000, 226 hours. So if I want to know how many hours this coloration represents, I would say my existing result times 2229, I think it was, divided by 100, because this is in percentage and I want to go to hours, this will now give me the actual sunlit hours for that period that my uh, coloration relates to. So 1,600 hours got direct sunshine in this place and 1,300 down here. So this is a quick and easy way of uh, doing some sort of custom numerical processing. It doesn't change the results under the hood, just changes the, uh, the unit and the numerical values that we get within our legend. If I wanted to, for example, say how many hours per day on average, well, I have here uh, 180 days. So if I put in 100. a divide here again, this is the average amount of hours per day that this element was sunlit. So 7.2 hours down here, 9.1 uh, hours or so up here. So and I would then change this to sunlit hours per day. I might need to expand that out a little bit. So, yeah, there's a, uh, some options there for coming up with um, you know, different related units. We also have here a script tab, which is a sort of advanced option it's detailed a little, little bit in the user manual, but I'll probably cover that hopefully in another video. Um, now to go through the options within this VI display section, we've got frame. So if I was doing an animation or a parametric analysis, so I was doing um, sort of a parametric analysis with different building heights or different shapes, then I could select here the frame or the step of the parametric analysis that I want to visualize for within this scene. As I've just done a static analysis, we only have uh, one bar available here, which is the current frame I did the simulation for. And you can see the current frame you're in by going into the timeline. And you'll see this is the current frame here. You will also see it in brackets up here, but my display icons are covering that at the moment. Uh, Legend Max, we can change the maximum value of our legend, and this will update the coloration of our sensing plane. We can do the same with the minimum. So this is handy if you want to have consistent looking results across different simulation scenarios then you can just set the legend max and legend min numbers manually here. 
we can change whether we want to move to a logarithmic or linear scaling for our coloration. We can change the colors in our legend and our um, mesh coloration. We can change the number of levels. So I might just come back to, that's all right. So we can change the number of levels for the coloration, which will affect both the legend and the uh, mesh color. I just turn off, I'll cover that in a moment. Um, legend levels, we can change whether this coloration on this mesh, they are blender materials that make that coloration. So if I'm in solid mode at the moment, if I come over to sort of rendered mode, where we can see sort of a fully rendered um, sort of visualization of the scene. Now the rendering of this scene will depend on the settings you've got set up in Blender. The rendering of this scene doesn't necessarily relate to any simulation you've done. But if we do render out the scene, because we want a sort of proper visualization of the context as well as the results, then you might notice that these materials, because they are now subject to the context that they're being rendered in, they can look dark or they, or you may not see them at all, or it could look muddy or whatever. Yeah. You wouldn't see these results being presented with any great clarity. So what I, what I can do is if I turn on emitter materials, then it, these, uh, the materials that are associated with this sensing surface and present the results coloration to us are now not really subject to any shading I've got going on in the background. So I can do a sort of full on rendered um, visualization of the context, but the result plane still stand out um, sort of unmodified or unaltered. You can change the strength of that emission of that sensing surface within this context with this emitter strength value. If I come back into my solid rendering mode, this isn't required because in solid rendering mode, we're already representing these colors without any particular um, consideration of the overall rendering context that they sit in. So I could turn that off. With the sensing object selected, I can toggle whether to turn off wireframe on it. So if you've got a particularly dense sensing mesh, then turning on wire can obscure things a little bit. So that's kind of up to you. Um, I can set the transparency of that sensing surface if I want to look at what's going on behind it. And that works a little bit better in sort of full visualization mode. But if we change the transparency, it doesn't really work. That's kind of, it is, that is, I must admit, kind of an experimental feature. But it might be worth playing in. In theory, it should allow you to sort of visualize what's behind the sensing surface, but I probably haven't got that completely nailed. Um, point visualization, this is important. important. So for this sensing surface, I can turn on point visualization. Now that looks a bit confusing right now. If I zoom in, you can hopefully see what it's trying to do. I just move my legend over here a little bit, or I might even just collapse that down for the moment. Um, we've now got a number being presented over each sensor point. So if I just reduce the font size of that, we can now see we've got numerics for each point of the sensor surface. And those numerics are positioned in the middle of our faces because it was faces that we selected as the basis of our sensor point. 
Now these numerical values will match up to whatever you've done in your modifier here. So because I'm doing sunlight hours per day, um, we can see it, that those are sunlight hours per day. If I was to remove my modifier, and if I just change my scene, we'll see that this now goes back to percentage sunlit, our default unit. So we can change the color of that font and we can have some shadowing of that font or turn the shadow off. If you get certain points on your sensing mesh where you're not getting numbers displayed, then what you can do is you can increase this position offset number which does a similar job to this offset number in the main simulation node. It just offsets the point at which the number is being visualized away from the sensing surface. Now that can be important if we have either of these two options selected, or especially this option. So. I could have selected more than one roof. I could have selected this roof and this roof. I could have as many roofs as I want, and I could have designated them all as sensing surfaces by associating a sensing material to them. If I have multiple sensing objects, then what I can do is I can enable this, which means I'll only present numbers for a particular sensing surface or my or my currently selected sensing surface. So this is putting the numbers in the 3D view can be sort of expensive and slows things down. So having selected only on uh, means the other objects that you don't currently have selected won't have the numbers projected onto them. We can also have this visible only option. Now if I just change my, now if I do, we'll see that even though my sensing object I mean, this is a bad example. We would never do, we would never visualize a sensing plane from this angle, probably. But just to demonstrate the point, we can see that even though this building is in front of our sensing surface, we, we're still showing numbers. So what we can do is turn on visible only. And now if I change my viewpoint, we can see that I'm only going to show numbers that I can see. So this is good, again, for just cleaning up the display of the visualization numbers within the scene. Now, for the purposes of this video, because I think I've probably gone on long enough, I think that is everything I need to cover. And if there is anything I've forgotten, I'll put a note to it in the blog post associated with this video but yeah i think that's everything so thanks for watching